Thank you so much, and good afternoon, everyone. Now, Canadians have an interesting and sometimes conflicted relationship with their water resources. In a 2017 Royal Bank of Canada study on water attitudes, most respondents answered that access to clean water should be considered a universal human right. Many also said that the country's seemingly endless abundance of water uh, is a critical element of its natural heritage and national identity. At the same time, though, many Canadians seemed surprisingly unconcerned about their water security. They worried far more about other things, the state of the economy, employment prospects, and access to affordable health care, to name only a few. Why worry about water when it's all around us? Now, the report speculated that the country's perceived endless abundance of fresh water and the overall very good drinking water quality in most of its urban centers might have led to some level of complacency when it comes to protecting our water resources and the infrastructure needed to deliver it. Now, if Canadians worry this little about the water gets into their homes, it's perhaps not surprising that even fewer ask themselves what happens once it, well, leaves them again. <laughs> Now, we rarely pay much attention at all to this seemingly simple appliance behind me, uh, which often marks one of the last steps before we, well, bid farewell to our domestic wastewater. More than half of the world's population actually don't have access to a toilet or any other form of safe sanitation. But here in Canada, there's normally one close by wherever we go. Perhaps because of our cultural norms, however, this otherwise quite remarkable fact is rarely the subject of conversations at work, the barbershop perhaps, or in the news media. The same can be said about the sewer systems uh, that convey the sewage from our homes to the wastewater treatment plants, to the processes that happen within those, or the impacts that wastewater effluent might have on the receiving environment. Out of sight, out of mind. Together with my team, I've done a lot of wastewater toxicology and chemistry work, and that topic was not necessarily a smash hit at dinner with family and friends, but that all changed overnight when the COVID-19 pandemic hit us in March 2020, and when my team and many other scientists around the world discovered that we could perhaps use wastewater to diagnose the spread of the virus in our communities. <coughs> now, I know, I know, we all like to keep those memories behind us, but there is much to be learned from this time and our experiences during this time, so please stick with me. In the early days of the pandemic, when the science of how the virus spread, how it would infect our bodies, and how patients could be treated seemingly evolved daily. The gold standard method of diagnosing infection was still very traditional, a nose swab and subsequent clinical testing. I'm sure many of us still remember fairly well having to drive all the way across town and then to wait in line for many hours, the not so pleasant experience of getting your nose swapped with a dry cotton ball, and then the long wait times before those results finally would become available. My wife Kirsten here and I, uh, we have four kids and like for many other uh, families, this procedure really turned into an agonizing ordeal for us that we try to avoid at all costs if possible. Some people were otherwise unable to seek testing, maybe for fear of losing their jobs, not having access to a vehicle, or many other reasons. There was also that issue of asymptomatic individuals who would catch the virus, uh, but could transmit it, would not show symptoms at all though, or only very mild ones. All these factors made that standard clinical testing was an imperfect way of tracking the virus. But for a long time, it was the only way. There was clearly a bottleneck, and amidst homeschooling our children, moving our university classes online, and trying to stay safe while being confined to our homes, my colleagues and I began brainstorming ideas on how we could try solve some of those problems of the clinical testing uh, through research. We came across reports that our bodies could shed the virus not only through our airways, but also, well, the other way, through our feces. Soon thereafter, researchers in the Netherlands actually isolated traces, genetic traces of the virus from wastewater, 
And the idea was born that perhaps we could revolutionize testing for COVID by testing wastewater, and that we could do so at the community or population level rather than the individual level, which you might have guessed it brings us back to the toilet bowl. <laughs> In short, not everyone would get swab tested, but everyone would need to use the facilities eventually. This approach is called wastewater surveillance and overcomes many of the limitations of traditional testing. Samples are conveniently delivered to the lab by the municipal sewer system, usually within a couple of days. They're well mixed and provide a really good cross-section of when and where a sample was dropped off. On top of that, the sewer does not discriminate between socioeconomic background, ability or willingness to get tested, or whether an individual has symptoms or not. Almost everyone would submit a sample pretty much every day, whether they like it or not. <laughs> In consequence, results of wastewater surveillance usually ran about seven to 10 days ahead of those of traditional testing, making it a leading indicator of impending surges in disease spread perhaps a bit like a pressure gauge for what is going on in a community. Now, since we had a lot of ongoing collaborations with the city of Saskatoon, our team was able to begin testing as early as July 2020. We quickly realized just how valuable this tool would be, and along with many other experts across the country, we began advocating for its value. We secured funding from the Public Health Agency of Canada, and within a few more months, we found ourselves leading the province's wastewater surveillance program, not only here in Saskatoon, but also in Prince Albert, North Battleford, as well as five First Nations communities. Now, in addition to reporting to public health decision makers directly, we also posted our results publicly on an online dashboard. That public interest was huge, and across the team, we gave about 300 interviews in the news media. Now, I had always dreamed of becoming that famous scientist who gets <laughs> recognized in public for their research, but not really quite for that research, maybe. <laughs> but hey, I mean, we were able to show that wastewater topics could indeed become the conversation starter at the barbershop, at work, or even around the dinner table. We're very grateful for that opportunity to have provided valuable information to the public at a time of dire need, and that we have helped many families and friends make decisions around how to get together safely. We're also grateful for the opportunity to contribute to easing the province's uh, impact and the pandemic's impact on the province in a time of dire need, and to help equip our public health decision makers with the information they so dire desperately needed. At the end of the day, though, we are researchers, and this technology, as well as the responsibility to run the program, have now been transferred to the provincial authorities, as well as a handful of rural, remote, and indigenous communities that we supported in establishing their own programs through a training initiative. Now, while the COVID-19 pandemic is over, or at least its pandemic phase, that is not the case for many of the other public health concerns that have resulted from or that have been amplified by it. Prescription rates of antidepressants, for example, as well as alcohol and substance abuse have all skyrocketed during the pandemic. Reduced physical activity, poor eating habits, and even changes in the food supply chain have all led to increased obesity rates and diseases that can be a direct result from it, for example, diabetes. Now, we, along with many other researchers active in this space, have kept our eyes peeled for new opportunities to apply the expertise and the infrastructure, the instrumentation that has been put in place during COVID to tackle some of these issues that are emerging now. Here in the province, we have indeed been able to successfully measure the levels of several pharmaceutical drugs, including antidepressants, anti-inflammatory drugs, cuff suppressants, to name a few in wastewater. For many of these drugs, there was a stark and lasting uptick in wastewater levels during the pandemic. Now, instead of collecting indirect data, for example, on drug prescriptions or maybe sales of over-the-counter uh, products, this tool now offers real-time insights into the actual consumption patterns, into when and where these products are actually consumed. 
Now, additionally, wastewater surveillance holds tremendous potential for helping ease the ongoing drug toxicity crisis, which since 2016 has sadly claimed over 35,000 lives here in Canada alone. Using wastewater, we can estimate the per capita consumption rates of recreational drugs and also detect the arrival of more toxic street drugs. Many of us have heard about drugs slazed with unknown and often varying amounts of highly toxic fentanyl or benzodiazepine sedatives, which can lead to combination effects when taken together with opioids such as fentanyl. Another substance that is recently on the rise in the street drug supply is a veterinary tranquilizer called xylazine that's not approved for use by humans and can actually induce horrible and rotting flash wounds. In a recent study published by Stats Canada researchers, they impressively show that consumption and levels of illicit drugs such as cocaine have been increasing in wastewater from various cities in Canada between 2020 and 2023. They also found that compared to other cities in Canada, levels of methamphetamine and amphetamine, for example, were highest here on the prairies in Edmonton, Saskatoon, and Prince Albert. Now, this type of data is really invaluable to public health professionals and can help direct harm reduction efforts to where they are needed the most. My last example of the untapped potential of wastewater monitoring is the community level surveillance of dietary habits. Now, beyond those substances that we consume and then later excrete into the wastewater system, researchers are now frantically searching for biochemical markers that our bodies produce and then release themselves. Changes in these markers could actually be used as indicators of our health status. We call those biomarkers, and the prospects of developing uh, this concept further are huge. From general stress levels to obesity, diabetes, heart disease, red meat consumption, et cetera, et cetera. The sky seems the limit. Now, while research in this space is clearly picking up speed, there is a need for public health professionals to guide that process and for government agency labs to adopt, centralize, and standardize these methods. But at the same time, I firmly believe that it is important for us to have open and frank discussions and conversations about ethical concerns associated with these methods. Perhaps we need to pause and consider if everything that can be measured also should be measured. Now, I want you to imagine a world where an increased level of a biomarker for red meat consumption in your block's wastewater now determines that you are required to pay extra for health insurance. Or imagine a world where corporations use the level of antidepressants in your neighborhood sewage to decide whether or not they want to offer you a job. Or imagine a world where a drug squad can legally raid your home based on the sheer suspicion of illicit drug use based on wastewater data. Now, these are some of the concerns I see when the lines between public health concerns and your privacy rights begin to blur. But now I want you to imagine a different world. I want you to imagine a world where we actually get this right, where we develop the right protocols and put the right checks and balances in place. Imagine a world where these data are used to inform and guide you concerning your personal health. Imagine a world where we can direct the limited healthcare resources to where they are needed the most. And imagine a world where we can reduce the harm that illicit drugs are causing in our communities. Wastewater surveillance does indeed, could be indeed a game changer in all of those areas. This space offers some truly exciting opportunities for our graduates who have a chance to lead and build this field from the ground up. Wastewater truly does hold untapped potential for public health decision makers, if only we're using it wisely. Thank you. Mm -hmm.